both counsel present. Thank you. Mr. Klein, did you wish to reserve time? Yes, I'd like two minutes for rebuttal, Your Honor. Okay, and I will do my best to find a discreet moment at 18 minutes to let you know that you're there. I please proceed. That. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Jonathan Klein. I represent the appellant in this matter. To give a brief overview of the facts, um, it's pretty clear that the facts are what the facts are based upon the record. There was, uh, the case was filed. This particular case is a foreclosure action. I like to call it a contract case. Uh, and the action was commenced on June 26, 2017, in which the, uh, the bank uh, lender in this case claimed to be a holder of the note under 673.3011 of the Florida statutes, which is required. Uh, they claimed holder status of the note. Uh, it's not a lost note case, and uh, they don't, we fall strictly under the 673.301-3011, and uh, we agree that it's a negotiable instrument, uh, that the note's a negotiable instrument. Um, was the, the, a copy of the original note was attached to the complaint, was it not? Yes, yes, it was. And um, um, the appellant, the, uh, uh, the appellee in their brief uh, cited to the Ortiz, Friedel, and Cronin, uh, the trilogy and other cases that followed the trilogy under the presumption that there's some kind of automatic standing here. But if you look at- Well, the if there's a copy of the original note attached to the complaint and then the original note is produced at trial, doesn't that satisfy the standing requirement? No. No, it doesn't, because the cases, if you read those cases, it states- Believe me, we've read them. Contrary evidence, absent contrary evidence. If there's contrary evidence and the, the own, the, the plaint, the appellee's own evidence here shows that there was a Bailey letter sent from AMIP Management, LLC, sent to the law firm of the appellee and that the appellee, signed the appellee's law firm, signed the Bailey letter that they had possession of the note four days, four days after the case. Oh, there's, that's, that's one interpretation, but that's not the interpretation the judge gave to the Bailey letter, correct? Yes, and the judge gave the wrong interpretation. We don't know who- Well, then it, it seemed to make sense that the, the date of the Bailey letter indicates that as of May the 10th, 2017, the original note was in possession of the bank. There's another date on the on the letter 63017, which the evidence was that that was the the acknowledgement signature date rather than the actual receipt of the note, and that's what, that's what the judge ended up concluding. Is right. But if you look at what's the, wrong with that, what's wrong with that conclusion? Because it was sent from AMIP Management LLC. Who's AMIP Management LLC? We don't know who they are. They're an unknown entity. If there was some well, there was a titling, there was a titling trust agreement entered into evidence, which, which at least according to the court, cleared up that connection. Correct, but the plaintiff that was testifying, the was uh, from a different entity. So the servicer was the one that basically was trying to state that there was constructive possession. But the constructive possession, there was no testimony as to the AMIP and how it affected a some kind of agent giving the law firm agent or constructive possession of the note. And my argument is if they didn't have it until four days after, they didn't have standing at the inception of the case. They may have had standing at the time of trial but not at the inception. But if that was an acknowledgement letter rather than a letter indicating the date that the original note was, was obtained, then your argument would fail then, correct? No, because they As signed- As did below? No, no, because they, they signed the Bailey letter stating that it was received four days after the complaint was filed. So if, you, if they're saying we got it four days after the complaint was filed, they didn't have possession of it. There's no constructive possession. It doesn't say they obtained it four days after. It says they have they have possession of it. Well, then they would need to provide other. So, so your your argument is is that was an abuse of the trial court's discretion to conclude the interpretation of the AMIP management Bailey letter as it did. Is that right? 
That is correct. And we get to, and the standard is the evidence is abuse of discretion, but the standard for reviewing standing is a de novo standard. Okay, I, I understand. It's the same argument that was made below. I understand what, what you're saying. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so when the case was, when we started the case out, there was a pretrial stipulation that only one witness would be called. That witness was Bernie Castro. I took the deposition of the witness. The witness stated um, that he was the witness that would be testifying at trial. And the uh, attorney uh, for the bank indicated that was the only witness. The pretrial stipulation was entered and signed by the judge on March 3rd, 2021. There was only one witness. Trial took place on March 5th. Um, when the case started out, the court, and I cited this on page 11 of, the, of our initial brief, the, um, the court uh, starts the case out and states, all right, so we have the case, Wilmington Savings Fund Society versus Christopher Strong and others set for non-jury trial today. And I know there's been a stipulation that the plaintiff would just have one witness. So this is the witness. There again, the court's interpretation of that stipulation was that it would be one live witness because the judge was trying to gauge how long to set aside for this trial. Correct? So no. Under if you look at the rule of civil procedure, you well, the judge allowed the reading of the deposition. So the judge obviously rejected the argument that this was only one witness. And and look how the judge the deposition of, of Ms. Gowan had been disclosed two years before trial. I, I don't know what, wh why would it, why would the, why would the deposition transcript be disclosed as a trial exhibit if there wasn't an intention that it was going to be read at trial? Well, if you look at rule of civil procedure, 1.330A3, that there's a, there's a way you can call a witness via a deposition transcript if you meet the requirements. And I cited this specifically in my brief that there was no, there was no proof that any one of those six factors applied for calling this witness via deposition. So even if the court's interpretation of the stipulation, which if you look at the Florida Supreme Court law that was cited in the reply brief, the Florida Supreme Court and the second district court of appeal states that when you have a stipulation, they're binding on the trial court and the appellate court, and that both parties must adhere to those stipulations unless there's a written motion filed before the court with an affidavit, which there was not here, that there, was be, that there should be some kind of relief from the stipulation. And then there's factors that you have to go in uh, uh, under the case law for the relief, but that didn't happen here. So let's travel forward to 1.330A3, that rule, is the rule that states, here's how you get a deposition from a, uh, a witness that testified before, and now they're trying to introduce it at trial. I may, Mr. Klein. With one rule. In, if, the, in, the, in the brief- Mr. Klein, yes. Mr. Klein yes, if I may, can I just interject? The, the, because this was an evidentiary matter, the court, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't the court privy to multiple emails between counsel and the record, as well as multiple exhibit list finding filings that confirmed that at least the deposition of Tracy Goins was always intended to be introduced by the bank? Would you agree with that? Um, I would say that there was uh, pre it was listed on the exhibit list, but when you have a stipulation that's subsequent to the exhibit list being filed, and then you have the stipulation signed by the judge. That's the stipulation. That's and, the stipulation. And, and, we suppose, can from that. and I suppose with us reviewing it at this point in time, the question for us is that with that stipulation, can, it, can a reasonable interpretation would be like one live witness at trial or simply one witness period to testify as trial. Isn't that our, our, uh, our review right now? Because you're taking the position that it should be just one live witness period at trial. That is correct. Include. So if we come to that conclusion, we'll need to ignore 
or do away with these multiple emails, all the exchange and everything that's been done in the record, which suggests that it was all along uh, 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 assumed that the deposition will be, will be used at trial? Well, if, if you look at the Supreme Court case, which is cited in my, um, cited in the reply brief, the Supreme Court states that uh, the stipulations are designed to simplify and narrow the issues and the evidence before the court to save time. But I saw, I'd also like to point out that the order scheduling pretrial signed by the judge says that witnesses and exhibits which are not listed as described may provide testimony or be admitted as allowed by order of the court. And again, if you have a stipulation pursuant to the Florida Supreme Court case law and the Second District Court of Appeal, you must have a, a written motion with a signed affidavit and it must comply with the reasoning under the, um, and that Second District Court of Appeal case is the burn said versus state. It states that, um, uh, that you can, you can deviate from it, but you have to do it properly. And it wasn't done here. Very simply. Mr. Klein, I do, I do have a question about an earlier comment. You referred to the rule of civil procedure 1.330, and I believe it'd be sub A3, about the six factors were not met. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that the witness's deposition she testified that she worked for a law firm and she was asked that she work in their Fort Lauderdale office. And she said that's where she worked exclusively. I, be, I think on the record page, the transcript of the trial page 90. Well, Fort Lauderdale is indeed 100 miles away from Pinellas County, isn't it? Two factors. That was two years prior to trial. So where is she at the time of the trial? Factor two. Uh, if we're appearing via Zoom, where is the place of trial? It could be Miss Magnelli's office. It could be my office. If you have Zoom, it could be the living room of the deponent. Well, it doesn't so, seem that the notice of appeal says that we appeal from someone's office or someone's location. We appealed from the circuit court, and the circuit court is based as a matter of law. This one in Pinellas County, either St. Petersburg or Clearwater, right? That's correct, but not when you have Zoom. Zoom, that rule doesn't contemplate Zoom hearings, which have been a, a factor in court proceeding in the last two years. And it doesn't contemplate the electronic connection, the internet that we have, which makes the court's accessibility from your living room or your office, which would be within a hundred miles. So the place of trial would be, one of the places of trial would be my office here at Weston, Florida, or it could be Ms. Magnelli's office, or it could be the Zoom connection at the deponent's home. But you need to- Is there an administrative order from the Chief Justice of our state Supreme Court that suggests that the location of trial uh, fluctuates based on Zoom and that these molecules that disperse in our atmosphere get to say that wherever they may disperse is the place of trial? You're saying that there is a Supreme Court order, Your Honor? No, I'm asking you, is there one? that you know, says that it fluctuates. So then why would the traditional rule be abolished merely because of mo molecules and technology in the absence of any decision or order to the contrary? Because the purpose of the rule is to make sure that the accessibility of the deponent isn't going to provide okay. an unnecessary hardship. And there's gotcha. no hardship when you can appear in your living room from your laptop computer or your cell phone and appear at trial and give testimony. And we asked that the we asked that the deposition be excluded because she testifies that there's a FedEx label that was attached, which would. I, I was just worried about the only argument I, I was raising, and I don't want to take you far afield, was the Rule 1.330 argument. You know, I understand that if that's where you're going, please feel free to go there. You know, I, I just didn't, I'm not trying to take you off your your points. No, that was my narrow that. question. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the. Um, we also objected that the deposition contained hearsay because there was a document that was attached or not attached to the deposition admittedly by the uh, bank's counsel, which was this FedEx label, which would show that the letter was whatever they're, they're, uh, they're have testified to about the letter being purportedly sent 
was not attached to the deposition. And the court, if the court before the court read or allowed the deposition into evidence, and this is addressed on page 16 of my, uh, my uh, initial brief, the court looked at the deposition and stated that because basically the court says because it filled in the gap for the, um, the testimony of this acceleration default letter that she was going to allow it in because it, it, it helped the court make the decision on uh, the lack of competent substantial evidence provided by the initial live witness. In other words, they read the depo. It's only it was only nine pages or eight pages, but the court reads the depo and comes up with the reasoning and states that well, because I read the depo and I like the depo, I'm allowing it in, and that's simply improper. And we argued to the court that, that was improper. And again, the deposition that the deponent states where her address is was two years taken, two years prior to the date of trial. And it's important that it's the date of the trial. Maybe she lives in Pinellas County. I don't know. We don't know that, but the plaintiff has the burden. So um, the argument under, under one point, a rule of civil procedure, 1.330A3 fails for the, uh, for the appellee. Um, If you're wondering, you're at about 16 and a half. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I think that if you look at the stipulation in the Florida Supreme Court law and, law and all the district courts of appeal, the third, the fourth, the second, and the fifth, they all follow the Florida Supreme Court, which is basically the law since almost a, a century now. And the cases have expanded from 1936 when the first case came, uh, was handed down by the Florida Supreme Court on these stipulations to present day, which in, in fact, the second district court of appeal chimed in on and it's in the brief, the case law is in the brief. Um, uh, and uh, we touched on the fact that the uh, the Mr. Castro's Mr. Castro's uh, testimony falls short of competent substantial case under the Mace and the Torres case for showing or proving that the acceleration letter was in fact sent. And when if, if our that, court if, if if our panel concludes that the Gallon deposition testimony was appropriately considered, would you agree that it? pretty well clears up any objection on the paragraph 22 issue? No, because the FedEx, the FedEx label. Well, the court found that even excluding the FedEx, there was such an unequivocal testimony that the, that the paragraph 22 letter was sent that the FedEx label issue was irrelevant. I, I would say that that together, no, it doesn't. There was testimony as to um, her knowledge of the business records but when she came down to the final, uh, the case law, and if you look at the case laws showing on certified letters, if you're relying on a certified mail receipt and you don't have it, then it doesn't, you don't prove, you're unable to prove that the letter was in fact sent. Well, the FedEx label is analogous to the certified mail. And That's you under the you're, at, you're a little bit past 18. So if you want to protect your time. I like to protect my time. Okay. I have cleared the timekeeping device so you don't start off at 19 or 18. That'd be a very quick argument, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Your Honor. May I proceed? Yes, please. Thank you. May it please the court. Uh, my name is Melissa Manganelli. I represent the appellee in this case. It's quite long. Wilmington Savings Fund Society. And I'll just call, and it goes on. I'll just call them Wilmington for, um, for the time being. Your Honors, appellant's entire argument is based on assumptions, but the problem is, is that the assumptions are not true. The first assumption is that the pretrial stipulation concerning calling one witness was violated 
or otherwise set aside. And I would agree with the comments and the questions that Justice Black had, and that obviously that assumption is it's appellant's position, appellee's position that that's false. You need to look at the facts and circumstances, and the case law tells us that stipulations are not technically construed, but should be interpreted in line with the apparent intent of the parties and in view of the result they were attempting to accomplish. And as Justice Black pointed out, the trial judge wanted to gauge how much time this trial was going to take. So she literally asked us, how many witnesses are you going to call? When I said one, that's who I called. I called one witness. And as Justice Black also pointed out, there was a witness and exhibit list uh, filed with the court. Um, opposing counsel had it over two years prior to the trial. And as I believe Justice Kuzan pointed out, there were several emails that are part of the record that I made sure when counsel came in, because he was not counsel two, priors, uh, two, two years prior, um, the Strongs had other counsel, and th that counsel was the counsel who attended that deposition of Ms. Gowan. So when Mr. Klein came in prior to the trial, I made sure, and that's why those emails are part of the record, I made sure that he received everything. So there were no surprises. So there would not be a question of whether or not he's prejudiced because he was not aware exactly of what plaintiff was intending to do once we had to go to trial. And that was made crystal clear in the witness and exhibit list. And this was listed as an exhibit, not a witness. This was listed as an exhibit, the deposition transcript of Tracy Gowan. So there was no prejudice or surprise to the appellants that I intend to, intended to use this deposition transcript at the trial. In addition, the appellant's second assumption was that there was no other competent evidence that the notice of default was said to the appellants. In fact, whether or not this deposition transcript was admitted into evidence, I believe is a red herring because there was other competent substantial evidence that the notice of default was sent to the appellants here. And that was the plaintiff's corporate representative witness, Mr. Castro. He testified he had been to my office. He was trained in our office's processes of sending out notices of default. And that's in the record, your honors, um, on page 1729, 1731 to, through 1732. And he describes to the court, the processes that my office uh, uses to send out these notices of default letters. So he did not specifically recall the date, but that does not render his testimony inadmissible or otherwise incompetent. He did say he recalled it was way before the pandemic. And that's sufficient, your honors. To the contrary, he had personal knowledge. He actually had personal knowledge of my office's mailing practices and procedures, which is sufficient and admissible under the rules of evidence. And I'd cite to Mace versus m and Bank decided by this court in 2020. As such, it's Apelli's position there was no abuse of discretion when the trial court admitted, admitted the notice of default into evidence. And actually, it was admitted into evidence through Mr. Castro's testimony, not through the deposition transcript of Ms. Gowan. That was just additional evidence. Um, Your Honors, do you have any questions for me on this issue? Because if not, I'd like to go to the standing and exception issue. I don't see any at the moment. I'm sorry? I said, I don't see any at the moment. Okay, thank you. So your honors, the second issue of, on, on appeal, which I'd like to address is whether or not the appellee proved standing at an, an exception of the case. And that brings me to the second assumption made by the appellants here is that the only evidence of plaintiff's standing at inception was the Bailey letter admitted into evidence at trial. But this completely ignores the other evidence that the appellee um, introduced at trial. The first is the testimony of Mr. Castro that Wilmington owned the loan as of February 14th of 2017. And that's important because Mr. Klein said in his opening remarks that the plaintiff pled the complaint as the holder of the note. And that's simply not true. I actually pulled the complaint while Mr. Klein was arguing and I looked at the complaint again, and it's on the record on page 32 of the record. Plaintiff is the owner and holder of the note and mortgage. That's what we pled in our complaint. 
And then on page 33 of the record, we say again in our complaint, plaintiff owns and holds the note and mortgage. So we did not just claim, plead, holder of the, of the note, we, pl we pled owner and holder of the note. So Mr. Castro testified, as I indicated, that Wilmington owned this, lo this loan, which was the note and the mortgage, as of February 14th of 2017, which was prior to the filing of the complaint. This was supported by the loan purchase agreement, which was admitted into evidence. In addition, we also introduced into evidence the notice of servicing transfer, which informed the appellants who the new lender was on the loan, which was Wilmington. This also predated the filing of the complaint, and that was also admitted into evidence. Number three, we also had admitted into evidence the recorded assignments of mortgage, all of which included specific language transferring interest in the note, and all of which predated the filing of the complaint here. The last piece of evidence, in addition to the fact, as Justice Black pointed out, that the original note that we filed later with the court was identical to the copy of the note that was attached um, as an exhibit to the complaint, but the last piece of evidence, which wasn't even necessary, just additional evidence, was that value letter from my office. Mr. Castro testified that it was sent to my office by the administrator of the trust. So contrary to Mr. Klein's argument, the administrator of the trust was American Mortgage Investment Partners. And as Justice Black pointed out, that was other evidence, the titling trust agreement that established that connection with the plaintiff. So it was the administrator of the trust sent us that, that those original loan documents, including the original note, prior to the filing of the foreclosure complaint. The fact that Mr. Klein disagrees with what he thinks the letter says does not render Mr. Castro's testimony inadmissible or otherwise not competent um, or not reliable. That's just Mr. Klein making assumptions based on his reading of a business record, which is not his business record. Mr. Castro is the one who testified as of the dates and the date clearly indicated that the administrator of the trust sent us the original note prior to the date that the complaint was filed. And as Justice Black also pointed out, the trial judge was the trier of fact, not Mr. Klein. So your honors, the fact of the matter is the plaintiff produced competent, substantial evidence of standing and of inception. And there is nothing in the record indicating that the trial court abused its wide discretion in admitting this evidence and in finding in favor of the um, Wilmington in this case. And your honor, um, your honors, I just wanted to point out because I know Justice Casanueva brought up the six factors um, in, in rule of procedure 1.330. I'd like to bring that up briefly because if you look at the transcript of the trial proceedings concerning now that now Mr. Klein has opted to argue that, well, there was no inquiry as far as where Ms. Gowan was, if she was over 100 miles and where the location of the trial was. But if you look at the transcript of the trial proceedings, your honors, Mr. Klein did not make any of those specific objections at trial. And as we all know, Specific objections not raised at trial are waived. So Mr. Klein did not raise these objections about the location of Ms. Gowan, whether or not she was 100 or more miles from the trial, where, where he considers the trial was, whether it be in Pinellas County or Broward County where the witness is located or whether it was in Palm Beach County where I'm located. So that's an important consideration as well, your honors, that Mr. Klein has opted to raise that objection for the first time in his briefs but he did not raise those objections during the trial. So I, I'm arguing to the court that he therefore waived those objections. As a matter of fact, my, I read the transcript again yesterday and my recollection is Mr. Klein actually said, well, your honor, she needs to read the transcript into the record. That's how she gets it in. And that's exactly what I did. Um, do your honors have any questions for me at this time? That pretty much concludes my argument. Nothing from me. Does not appear to be any questions at this time, uh, although so I, I suspect each member of the panel appreciates your boosting us up in stature by calling us justices. We appreciate that. 
I don't think there's a pay raise that a comment you know, that follows that comment, but we thank you for the comment. <laughs> and then uh, we will go ahead, let me clear. And uh, Mr. Klein, you still have your two minutes remaining, sir. Yes. See, Mr. Castro had no idea of what year he visited the office of the uh, appellee's counsel's attorney law firm. You need to know approximately the date. So you can state that that was the date or that was the time I learned of this business record keeping procedure that was done at or near the time. And there's no testimony on the record to show when he was trained. Um, case law is clear on stipulations. The Florida Supreme Court has ruled on this. The second district court of appeal has ruled the fourth and the third, and they're the same across the board. They are the gospel. They are binding on the trial court and the appellate court. I prepared for trial based upon the stipulation. If it was counsel's intention to call the witness, Ms. Gowan, via deposition, she would have put it on the stipulation. Under one under rule of civil procedure, 1.330A3, the burden is on the party seeking to introduce the document. They failed to go through the analysis. It doesn't require an objection. Um, ownership, understanding, under the standing concept, when you allege holder status, Ownership is irrelevant. I cited to the Angelini case. The assignments of the mortgage and note are irrelevant for, more, for, holder, for holder status when under understanding. A loan purchase agreement is irrelevant under holder status. You must show the court at the time you filed the case, you had possession of the note. You had to have possession. If you don't show possession and the Bailey letter is four days signed, four days after the complaint is filed, your own evidence states you didn't have it. Thank so you, counsel. No your time has uh, since expired and uh, that would conclude your remarks. I, I thank you both for your presentation. Please stay well. We hope either to see you in person in the future or perhaps we'll continue to use these molecules